Hello everyone, welcome to February's This Month in World War II. This month's feature is on the Battle of the Corson Cherkassy Pocket that took place along the Eastern Front between the Germans and the Soviets from the end of January 1944 throughout February 1944. For this month's report, Paul rotated back onto his D-Day Germans. Sadly, we don't have any bag ration Germans yet for you guys. I'm playing my Soviets again as a push for painting. I'm working on finishing my Katyushas, some SMG teams, some VA-64 trucks, and some AA half-tracks. The majority of dates and specific battle information I used for this video are pulled from a multitude of sources. To name just a few, Britannica, the documentary Soviet Storm, a fantastic book I found titled Stalingrad to Berlin, Hitler's Defeat in the East, and as always, my opinions I've compiled over my years of research on World War II and the Eastern Front. The music you're hearing is from a fantastic project I discovered by accident called Muse Open. They have a single goal, and that's the sharing and collecting of copyright-free music for content creators to use, and for musicians to have a source of inspiration all with the goal of advancing the art of music. I'll drop a link to their website below. As always, these videos are meant to be purely educational and no copyright infringement is intended. Following the failure of Operation Citadel at Kursk during the summer of 1943, the Germans began a general retreat across the entire front. In the autumn, Army Group South fell back to the Panther-Voltan line. These were a planned line of defenses that followed the Dnieper River. There were a few big problems with this line, the main ones being that the defenses were still in planning and the majority of them didn't even exist yet. The fighting was brutal, with wide open tundra and freezing ground making ideal area terrain for tank clashes and armored warfare. At the start of December 1943, the Panther Votan line was breached, and the Red Army had crossed the Dnieper in force at multiple bridgeheads. General Wilhelm Stemmermann, commanding the 8th Army, was the only German position that managed to hold. This formed a salient, or bulge, in the German defensive line that was almost 100 kilometers, roughly 62 miles, long centered around the town of Korsun. Soviet Marshal Georgi Zhukov quickly realized that he could repeat the successes of Stalingrad from the prior winter by encircling and destroying the German 8th Army at Korsun. He recommended using the 1st and 2nd Ukrainian fronts to crash through the German defenses and form two armored circles surrounding Korsun. The outer circle, or ring, would dig in and face outward to prevent any German counterattack from reaching the trapped men. The inner circle would slowly squeeze, destroying the 8th Army. Manstein and other German generals saw the writing on the walls, and remembering Stalingrad repeatedly warned Hitler about the threat of encirclement. Hitler had other plans, seeing the salient as the perfect location to launch a German offensive in the summer of 1944. The exposed 8th Army was not allowed to pull back. On January 15th, Zhukov briefed his field commanders on the plan of attack. The initial punch would come from General Konyev's 2nd Ukrainian Front. General Vatutin's 1st Ukrainian Front would then push from the northwest. These two fronts would then meet to complete the encirclement of the German 8th Army. On January 24th, the Russian attack began, with Konyev's 2nd Ukrainian Front attacking in force. This quickly caused a breakthrough in the German lines, which was rapidly exploited by the 5th Guards Tank Army and the 5th Guards Cavalry Corps on January 25th. Vatutin's 1st Ukrainian Front attacked from the north, encountering similar success. This newly formed 6th Tank Army surprised the Germans, but the inexperience of the attackers showed as they took a long time to penetrate the western front of the salient. On January 28th, a mobile group of the 5th Mechanized Corps occupied the town of Lysiantka. Moving into the outskirts of Zveniordka, this is where the 6th Tank Army of the 1st Ukrainian Front and the 20th Tank Corps of the 2nd Ukrainian Front closed the circle. The two fronts trickled together and formed the outer ring of defenses, placed to prevent a German counterattack from occurring. Troops and armor from the 27th, 52nd, and 4th Guard armies poured into the inner ring, preparing to squeeze on the newly surrounded 8th Army. 
Inside the pocket, command was given to General Wilhelm Stemmermann, and the trapped army was designated as Group Stemmermann. They consisted of elements of the 5th SS Panzer Division Viking, the 5th SS Infantry Brigade Valuin, the Estonian SS Infantry Battalion Narva, and several thousand Russian auxiliaries. Altogether, they numbered at roughly 60,000 men. The 5th SS Panzer Division had 30 Panzer III and IV tanks and assault guns, with six more being repaired, and 47 artillery pieces, with 12 of those being self-propelled guns. This was surrounded by over 336,000 Red Army soldiers, 500 plus tanks, and over 5,000 mortar and artillery pieces. Manstein quickly threw together a relief effort, and by early February, forces from the 3rd and 47th Panzer Corps stood ready to counterattack through the Soviet encirclement to reach Group Stemmermann. However, Hitler overruled the planned relief effort, ordering the attack to be modified into a counter-encirclement of the two Soviet army groups. I feel like I shouldn't have to explain why this is such a bad idea. The combined forces of the 3rd and 47th were around 80,000 men and pushing 250 tanks. Pure numbers alone show that you cannot counter encircle a force over twice the size of you. This is just another instance of showing how Hitler's continued tightening grip on military planning while simultaneously slipping on reality made bad military situations even worse. The counter encirclement was att attempted until February 8th until it could no longer be denied that it had failed. At this point, Manstein ordered the two corps to combine their forces and make a focused effort to break through the Soviet defenses. Reforming these forces took an additional three days. On February 5th and 6th, Kandyev ordered the 4th Guards Army and the 5th Guards Cavalry Corps to split the pocket on the boundaries of the 5th SS Panzer Division and the other attached corps. This attack ran into issues almost immediately. General Stemmermann and General Lieb, his second-in-command, read the Soviet moves perfectly and deployed their limited armor to blunt the push. The Soviet push was reorganized and renewed between 7th of February through the 10th of February, but was hobbled by supply shortages caused by Third Corps' push towards the pocket in their attempt to relieve Group Stemmermann. Soviet supplies had to be rerouted to the 2nd Ukrainian Front. Despite these issues, the 2nd Ukrainian Front closed in on Korsun by the 10th of February, collapsing the pocket to an area of roughly 6 by 7 miles. On February 11th, the combined push began towards the gilnoi tikich River. Progress was rapidly made by the Germans as they cut through the outer Soviet defenses. Zhukov ordered Vatutin to assemble four tank corps to cut off the German spearhead inside of the pocket. At this point, however, the weather warmed. The stark contrast to the previous winter became quickly apparent as February fields turned to bogs of snow and mud. Roads melted into a soft mud and gravel. This slowed the Germans, whose mechanized support vehicles were two-wheel drive. These trucks would become bogged down in the soft terrain and have to be removed or excavated to continue their advance. However, the Soviets were equipped with Lend-Lease U.S. four-wheel and six-wheel drive trucks. They still had difficulty in this mud, but fared better than their German opponents. The push continued until the afternoon of February the 15th, when the Third Corps established a beachhead on the east side of the Gilnoi Tikich River. Soviet counterattacks and manpower halted the push towards Group Stemmermann. All the Third Corps could do was dig deep and wait for Group Stemmermann to meet them. As soon as Group Stemmermann had been encircled on January 25th, the Luftwaffe had been conducting an aerial resupply operation. While only half the required materials were delivered, this operation was much more successful than the resupply attempts at Stalingrad. This was mostly due to the fact that Group Stemmermann was much smaller than the encircled 6th Army, and that the Luftwaffe were able to better concentrate their aircraft on the relief effort. From the 11th to the 16th of February, Stemmermann maneuvered his forces to the north side of the pocket, reorientating his thrust to his escape. He positioned himself to move on towards the relief forces that held the bridgehead at the Gilnoi Tikich River. The encircled forces aimed at capturing key villages while moving towards the bridgehead. 
Among those were Vovobuda, Kamarakov, Kaliki, and Shandarovka at the southwestern perimeter of the pocket. The overall goal for this was to establish an area for a jumping off point for the breakout attempt. Fierce fighting ensued. On the 11th of February, the German 72nd Infantry Division captured Nova Buda and Kamarovka. On the evening of 15th of February, Kaliki was secured and then held against a Soviet counterattack. The village of Shandarovka was captured by the 72nd Infantry, but then retaken by the Soviets. The 5th SS Viking counterattacked in force, retaking the village. The 5th SS Viking Division was mostly made up of Scandinavian volunteers. They managed to keep their tracked armored personnel carriers intact throughout most of the fighting, and Stemmermann used this to his advantage. Throughout the maneuvering in the pocket, the 5th SS was the most used, most effective, and contributed the most to the overall success of 8th Army's actions inside of the pocket. They were deployed back and forth, taking full advantage of their tracked vehicles. Stemmermann used them to plug holes in lines, blunt Soviet pushes, and even for rapid counterattacks to push enemies back. The 5th SS was on constant maneuvers throughout their ordeal in the course on pocket. By nightfall on the 16th of February, the 3rd Panzer Corps bridgehead and Group Stemmermann were only 7 kilometers or 4.3 miles apart. Manstein acted without waiting for a decision from Hitler, radioing Stemmermann. The breakout attempt was authorized, and Group Stemmermann mobilized to reach the bridgehead. Hill 239 was in Soviet control and had caused constant problem for the 3rd Corps. The radio message Manstein sent failed to relay this information, but Stemmermann quickly realized who was in control of the hill soon enough and was forced further south towards the Gilmoytikich River. On the morning of the 17th of February, Group Stemmermann realized that their vehicles and heavy equipment could not maneuver through the soft mud in the hillsides. Making the difficult decision, they destroyed their equipment and continued moving forward. Once the Soviets realized the Germans were making a break for it, they rained hell on them. Armor and artillery opened up from Hill 239. Their supporting infantry had been decimated by 3rd Corps, however, so the majority of this fire came from a distance. However, once it became clear that the Germans had no heavy equipment or AT guns of any sort, the Soviet armor and Cossacks charged the infantry, slaughtering them wholesale and crushing them beneath their tracks. An excerpt from John Erickson's book, The Road to Berlin, page 178, captured the scene early morning, 17th of February. Under the yellow sky of early morning and over ground covered with wet snow, Soviet tanks made straight for the thick of the column, plowing up and down, killing and crushing with their tracks. Almost simultaneously, massed Cossack cavalry wheeled away from the tanks to hunt down and massacre men fleeing for the refuge of the hills, hands held high in surrender as the Cossacks sliced off with their sabers. The killing in this human hunt went on for several hours, and a new round opened on the banks of the river Yonoi Tekic, where the survivors of the first collision of the German column with the Soviet troops dragged and fought their way. By midday on the 17th, most of the surviving Germans had reached the river, which due to the warming weather and melting snow, had swelled to 15 meters, or 49 feet wide, and over 2 meters, 6.5 feet deep. Panic ensued, with remaining vehicles being driven straight into the river. Trees were rapidly chopped down to construct makeshift rafts. Hundreds of men drowned with many others succumbing to shock and hypothermia. German engineers worked rapidly, building bridges across the river. Their rear guard units of the 57th and 88th Infantry allowed many more men to cross the river safely, including at one point up to 600 wounded. The Germans then proceeded to pull back, with skillful rear guard actions of engineer units keeping the Soviets at bay, armed with Tigers, Panthers, and the know-how of blunting Soviet attacks. The many Germans that escaped back to friendly lines at Lysyanka was due in great measure by the rapid response and exertions of the 3rd and 47th Panzer Corps as it cut through the Soviet lines. Manstein had made sure that the core formation of 3rd Corps, the primary force trying to reach Group Stemmermann, was equipped with companies of Tiger and Panther tanks and attached engineer battalions with specialist bridging skills. While most of the Germans did manage to escape the pocket, it is still viewed as a Soviet victory due to the fact that the Germans had to torch most of their equipment in order to escape. 
The other massive effect of this battle is the Soviets were able to launch offensives in two other sectors against the whole of Army Group South, continuing the forced retreat of the Germans across the Eastern Front. Wilhelm Stemmermann was killed during the final stages of the breakout when his command car was hit by a Soviet anti-tank gun. Lieb survived the war. Vatutin was shot by Ukrainian nationalist UPA insurgents on the 29th of February 1944 and died on April 15th. Kanyev was promoted to marshal following the victory at Korsun. The mission I used to make this is a heavily modified breakout mission. I wrote in special rules to showcase the unique situations facing Group Stemmermann in the course on Pocket. These rules were written so that any army can play this mission, not just a German or Soviet force. I went back and forth on the use of the classification of attacker and defender in this mission due to the nature of the battle. It could easily be interpreted that both forces would be the attacker in this mission, or the argument could be made that the Soviets would be the defending force in their offensive campaign. Unfortunately, this is the nature of highly mobile warfare. It becomes difficult to determine who is the attacker and defender on such a small scale. To attempt to solve this, I simply came up with new terminology for the forces used. Instead of attacking and defending, there is the breakout force, Group Stemmermen, or the force attempting to escape, encirclement. And there is the blocking force, the Soviet army or force attempting to prevent their prey from escaping. I'll link the Google Drive folder this mission is in, and all my other This Month in World War II missions are in. Eventually, if the channel gets large enough, I hope to start a website that would cache these missions and reports, but I'm not going to get too far ahead of myself. There are three main features to this mission that will spice it up a little, and I'll have them listed in the description. As Paul and I played this mission, we discovered and tweaked some of the mission rules. I will mention this when it occurs, but the mission available for download is, I think, version 5? I went through a lot of drafts with multiple people for balancing purposes to uh, try and make this a even game. Both Paul and I brought 105 points to the table. Paul is running D-Day Germans, and I'm running Bagration Soviets. We both wrote our lists with this mission in mind, so it will be interesting to see how it plays out. Paul, the Germans, played as the breakout force, and I played as the blocking force with my Soviets. Paul brought a list out of D-Day Germans and another list out of D-Day Waffen-SS to represent the forces trapped in the course on pocket. The two formations he used was a beach defense company and an armored SS Panzer Grenadier company. For the Beach Defense Company, he took the mandatory HQ unit of two SMG teams, two platoons of five MG42 teams, a Beach Defense SMG34 machine gun platoon with four teams, a mortar platoon with four 8cm mortars, and a tank hunter platoon with three 7.5cm guns. For the Armored SS Panzer Grenadier Company, he took the two HQ SMGs and two platoons of seven MG42 teams equipped with Panzerfausts and their half-tracks. All of his support options were pulled from the Waffen-SS book, with a unit of three WESPs, a Panzer III OP tank, four 8.8cm AA guns, an armored AA platoon of three SDKFZ-71 armored 2cm quad trucks, and an SS Tiger platoon with two Tigers. For his command cards, he took Front Swine and Lucky. I brought a list out of Bagration Soviets to represent the force attempting to stop the German breakout. My primary formation is a T-34-85 battalion with its single HQ tank and two companies of seven tanks each. They included a platoon of six 82mm mortars and a hero SMG company of five SMG teams and their commissar. In support, I took a hero moto rifle company with seven DPMG teams, their commissar, and two Maxim HMG teams. For reconnaissance, I took a platoon of three BA-64s, two armed with MGs, and one armed with the PTRD. They're deploying with an armored recon platoon of four SMG teams and two SDKFZ half-tracks. I took a battery of Katyushas and a BA-64 OP car. I took the Lucky, Make Your Own Luck, and Reconnaissance by Combat Command cards to round out my list. 
This is the table Paul and I put together. The short table edge on the left being the breakout forces, shown in red, and the short table edge on the right with the river being the blocking forces, shown in blue. Deployment zones are shown here. Next we place the objectives. Paul placed the first objective as per the mission rules inside his deployment. We modified this after the game to be the blocking force placing the first objective inside of the breakout forces deployment. Paul then placed the first centerline objective, red, and I placed the final centerline objective, blue. I then placed four minefields outside Paul's deployment, shown in blue. We then placed our ranged in markers. Here's a better view of the Soviet ranged in markers. Paul selected his reserves, placing the Tigers, a platoon of armored SS Panzer Grenadiers, and the HQ of the armored SS Panzer Grenadiers to be held in reserve and prepared to deploy the rest. The 88s were held in ambush. My Soviets then deployed their force, starting with two spearhead moves from the BA-64 platoon and the armored recon platoon. They then deployed all of their units forward except for the Katyushas, which stayed inside of the forest at the bottom of the table. Paul didn't have any spearhead moves and went right into deployment. His two beach defense grenadier platoons were placed at the edge of his deployment. The platoon of armored SS Panzer Grenadiers was placed in the three-story building spread out among floors with their half-tracks mostly behind them. The mortars were placed behind the three-story building. The HMGs were placed in the mostly destroyed building. The 7.5 centimeter AT guns deployed in the forest staring at the T-34s. The WESPs deployed in the fields behind everything with their Panzer III OP watching the road, and the Quad AA trucks deployed forward in the forest. After deployment, recon by force triggers and the Katyushas ranged in shifted up slightly. No reserves arrived for Paul, but he did manage to score one victory point for the objective in his deployment zone. Beach Defense Platoon 1 crosses the road and takes up shop in the house contesting Objective 2. Beach Defense Platoon 2 moves into the minefields preparing to clear them, setting some off. Fortunately, no one was hurt, but the platoon is now pinned. They now contest Objective 3. The quad trucks move forward, but two of them fail their cross checks. The quad trucks, Beach Defense Platoon 2, the HMGs all fire at the Hero Moto Rifle Company dug in around and inside the house at Objective 3. They cause enough hits to pin it, but no Soviets fall as they keep their heads down. The Beach Defense Platoon inside the house and the Wesps fire on the Hero SMG Company, causing a team to fall and pinning them. The 8 centimeters fail to range in on the Hero SMGs. The Pac 40s fire on the T 34s, scoring a single hit and kill as one detonates from the German high-velocity shells. No victory points were scored due to Paul's contesting of the objectives. Minor movements happened, with the Hero SMGs moving forward, the Armored Reconnaissance Platoon shifting down, and the T-34 HQ moves down to get a line of sight through the burning wreck, and 2nd Company does a 180. Katyusha's rocket the HMGs in the destroyed house, causing a team to fall and pinning the survivors. The 82mm mortars range in on Beach Defense Platoon 2, causing two hits and killing the platoon leader. The Hero Moto Rifle Company then fires everything they have at Beach Defense Platoon 2 as well, killing every last German and scoring a victory point for the Soviets. The T-34s fire on the Beach Defense Platoon inside of the house, but kill none of them. The SMGs add their fire with the T-34s, pinning them. The Hero SMG Company charges the Beach Defense Platoon inside the house, a single team falling to the defensive fire. The Germans fail their counterattack and break off. The Soviets then occupied the house. Turn 1 ends with a tie of 1-1 for victory points. Objective 1 fades. The HMGs and remaining Beach Defense Platoon both fail their rallies and no reserves show up. The quads fail their cross checks again, and the SS Armored Panzer Grenadiers mount up in their 251s to move out, but two of the half tracks fail their cross check on the stone wall. 8 centimeter mortars range in on the Hero SMG Company, pinning them, but no teams fall. The SMGs fire on the Hero SMGs as well, causing more hits, but no casualties. 
The quad trucks again open up on the Hero Moto rifles, causing multiple hits and a single team falls. The AT guns open fire on the T-34s again, this time knocking two out. The Hero SMG company rallies and the Soviets score two victory points. The armored reconnaissance platoon moves back, preparing for the German reserve's arrival, with the BA-64s moving along the road doing the same. The T-34s that have been taking fire from the AT guns move forward, getting out of view of the guns. The Hero SMG company falls back behind the burning T-34s. The Katayushas salvo away at the heavy machine guns again, causing another casualty. Turn 2 ends with a 3-1 lead for the Soviets. Objectives 2 and 3 are removed. The AT guns rally, and the HMGs pass their last stand check. The Tigers finally roll on from reserve. The formation command of the Beach Defense Grenadiers moves forward to position himself to oversee the remaining platoons and AT guns. The HMGs move to the three-story house to hopefully avoid more Katyusha rockets. The quad tracks issue orders to cross here and finally manage to get out of the forest and grind forward. The half tracks turn around and begin to loosely follow the quad trucks. The AT guns fire on the T-34 formation HQ bailing it. The WESPs and the quad trucks fire on the Hero Motor Rifle Company, causing a team to fall and the survivors to be pinned. The Tigers open up on the second company of T-34s and miss. I failed every single one of my remounts and rallies. The armored recon and second company of the T-34s move towards the Tigers. The BA-64 shift to begin moving towards the Katayushas, but fail their cross checks for getting off the road. First company of the T-34s punch it, advancing to the remaining beach defense grenadier platoon. The Hero SMGs move forward towards the Hero motor rifles holed up inside of the house. The Katyushas manage to range in on the three-story house and continue to pummel the HMG platoon, pinning them but not causing any hits. The mortars manage to hit the beach defense AT guns, but no casualties are incurred. The first company of T-34s unloads their MGs into the remaining beach defense grenadier platoon, destroying them and scoring the Soviets another victory point. Second company of the T-34s fire on the Tigers, causing two hits. Paul passes one armor save and fails the other. I roll my firepower check and get a bail. This is when you use Lucky and what I had saved it for. I do the reroll and manage to destroy the Tiger. Turn 3 ends with the Soviets in the lead, 4-1. to one. At the start of turn 4, the AT guns fail their rally, and the HMGs fail their last stand and flee, giving another victory point to the Soviets. The Tigers fail their last stand, and Paul uses his lucky to reroll. Fortunately, the remaining Tiger stayed. The 88mm AA guns reveal themselves, and the armored SS Panzer Grenadiers arrive from reserves. At this point, after discussion, Paul forfeited the game. So even with all the revisions that happened to this mission before playing through it, there were some big ones that both Paul and I agreed will be put into the version I'm giving to you guys. First and foremost, there's another way for the breakout force to score victory points. We both agreed that any unit that is in the relief bridgehead at the end of the game can and will score the breakout player a victory point, not counting units arriving from reserves. The other thing that changed is making the game last maximum 6 turns instead of 5. While I originally did this to put pressure on the players, it inadvertently made it more difficult on the breakout player because they had so few ways to score victory points. The more minor alterations were in the pre-game steps, the blocking force placing the first objective in the breakout force's deployment to force some tactical decisions on both players' parts. In terms of gameplay, Paul's biggest gripe was his handling of the single armored SS Panzer Grenadier unit he had deployed on the table. We also discussed again using the Pac 40s in ambush instead of the 88s, and the pros and cons of the big gun rule in terms of ambushing. All in all, however, it was a different style of game and we both enjoyed it. If you've noticed the new map, it's from Frontline Gaming, and I'm, and I'm a massive fan of it minus one thing. It's only 71 inches long instead of the 72 inches. 
I reached out to customer support and they got back to me rather quickly, explaining that the mats that they make have a 0.1 to 0.03% um, error, basically. And they offered a 15% refund for purchasing another mat at 50% off. So, needless to say, I have another mat in the mail and I'm extremely happy with the customer service I've received from them. As always, thank you, thank you for watching. Please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit that little bell icon to be notified when my next video drops. The rules we used for this are linked in the description. If you can, play a game or two with any of my modified missions and let me know how it goes. I'd love to hear feedback and stories from your battles. My plan going forward is releasing a video around this time, at the end of the month, but have the month's focus be on the next month so anyone can have a chance to play with history in mind for that month. Unfortunately, that means we're going to be missing March for this year, but there's always next year. Again, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in March for the next episode of This Month in World War II. Did using the first and second Ukrainian fronts to crash through the German defenses and form two armolds... Armold? Armold? What the fuck is an armold? The town of Lysianka, moving onto the outskirts of Zvenoradka... Mm. 7th through 10th of February, but was hobbled by supply shortages and in order to escape. The other massive effect of this battle is the Soviets were able to launch offensives in two other sectives. Sec